Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? We are going to partake in the Lord's Supper. I'm going to give you just a minute to go ahead and open your bread. And as I'm doing that, we're excited to begin a new series. Pastor Haley is going to lead us all month in a series called Fix Your Thoughts. And I, I don't just want this to be uh, uh, something that is a mere tradition that we do in church, but I, I really want you to think about what you are about to participate in. I want you to think with me briefly. Really let your mind go to the place where Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, the Bible tells us. And if you're a parent and you've ever had a conversation with your children, and you're as serious as you can be, but in that moment you understand that your children just don't quite really understand what you're telling them. I believe that's how Jesus felt in that moment when he was telling his disciples, listen, I, I have to go away. And I can only imagine what was going through the heart and mind of Jesus knowing that in just a few short moments that he would feel the worst pain physically that he would ever feel when he was beaten and bruised when the crown of thorns was placed on his head when he was forced to carry the very cross that would be the tool that would reconcile us father we're not worthy just want to ask you in this moment to let your heart and your mind go here we are children of the most high god and that some of us struggle so much with feeling loved, but you need to understand, even in all your brokenness, that Jesus loved you so much. He saw you at your worst, and he still said, not my will, Father, but yours be done. And I will go. I will go for them. In that moment when he was sitting in the upper room with his disciples, the Bible tells us in Matthew, it says this, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. As we get the bread out this morning or the wafer or whatever we want to call it, let's really fix our thoughts on Jesus. Let's partake of the bread this morning. Most of us, if we knew what was about to face us, if we knew what we were walking into us, if we're walking into most of us, if we're being honest, we would probably turn the other way and do everything we could to get out of that. But Jesus, obedient till the last breath, he goes on to say this, says, and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people it is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many let's partake of that this morning father if we could say anything this morning it's a simple thank you thank you Jesus that when you saw me at my worst, you still said, that is my child, and not my will, Father, but yours be done. Father, I ask that this Christian walk, this life of faith, that it's not just something that defines us by stepping foot in a church, but it, we are defined because we are the church, Father, and we are a new creation, Lord. And each and every day I'm being renewed, I'm being made into the image of Christ. Father, let that be our prayer this morning. And we say this humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Thou 
just real fast. I just want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think about one good thing that God has done for you, done in your life this week. Just one good thing. Can you just close your eyes and think about that for just a second? a reason for that. We'll talk about it in just a minute. I promise there's a method behind my madness. I want to take a moment and welcome you to Victory this morning. I look out and lots of new faces, or at least new to me, you know, I wasn't here last week, and so I know we're growing every week, picking up, building steam, picking up uh, speed, so it's exciting to see some of you that we haven't seen in a while back here with us this morning. As Pastor Jeremy said, I'm going to be with you for the next few weeks. We're starting a new series this morning called Fix Your Thoughts. And the title of my message this morning is Stinking Thinking. <laughs> Stinking Thinking, because we are all guilty of it. We are all guilty of it. Every single one of us in here at times has negative thoughts that cross our mind, and we have to battle our thought life. But sometimes we've become so ingrained, it's just become such a habit for us that we don't even question the things that cross our mind. We don't, even, we don't even stop to think, is that healthy? Is that right? Is that good? And we just become victims of our thought lives. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we are not victims. We are not victims. We are more than conquerors. We are more than overcomers. And I know God has a word for us this morning. You can have a seat. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get excited. I wasn't going to let you sit down. You're going to stand up the whole time. They were going over my notes with me in the back this morning, and, and one of the media team pulled me aside. He said, um, are you going to let us out of here before dinner today? I said, <laughs> I said yes, I'm going to try. <laughs> there is a lot that we have to cover because I, I, there's just so much. When you get into um, the study of, of our minds and our thoughts, there's so much research, so much that we could address. I want to dive into Scripture, but before I do, let's, let's pray together. And then we're going to go to the Word. Pastor, you can just move all my stuff. Just throw it on in the floor. Don't worry about it. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to get into God's Word. Father, we're so thankful, so thankful that we can gather together this morning among your people. Lord, among your presence, Lord, that we can walk in. And Lord, as we begin to sing, Lord, that we can experience your presence. Lord, and not just that, Lord, but that as we hear your word, Lord, that, that lies would be cast down, Lord. Things that we believe that aren't true, Lord, would be, would, light would be shown in the darkness. Lord, I just ask for your anointing this morning, Lord, that it would rest on your messenger, Lord, for, that you would go before me, Lord, and just clear all the paths, all the distractions, 
Lord, and let your word be planted down deep in each one of us this morning. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. I'm Haley Bryant. I'm the children's pastor here, one of the staff pastors, and I'm so excited to be with you um, over these next few weeks. I hope that doesn't run anybody off. So I'm looking out this morning, and I'm going to take inventory next week. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> but I know that the Lord has a word for us this morning um, regarding our thought lives. And, and here's how I know that, because when we started planning this year, last year, we were mapping out the series. As pastors, it's our job to seek the Lord, to seek scriptures, and to really try to discern what God has for his people. And so we spend time together praying and, and preparing for the year. And so early in the year, I knew um, I really wanted to do a series to address mental health because that's a topic that is it's almost non-existent in the church. We just don't talk about it. And so I knew, I felt the Lord's leading that I wanted to do a series to address mental health, but more specifically our thought lives. And so pastor asked me back in February if I wanted to, to do the series then, but I was, you know, I was like 15 months pregnant and it wasn't happening. I'm going to waddle up here. I couldn't even, t I couldn't even walk across the room without getting out of breath. So there was no way, you know, <laughs> and at different points in the year, we tried, we tried to, to nail it down, but it, we settled on November and I don't think that it's by accident that we are going to be talking about our thought lives and negativity when we're in the midst of what we're in the midst of in our, in our nation. There has never been a time that I, since I've been alive, and that's not saying much, but if you talk to older generations where there's been so much divisiveness, so much, politi so much polarization politically, racially, socially, there's just so much tension in our world right now. And so I don't feel like this timing was by accident. I feel like God orchestrated. God designed this for such a time as this. I believe that. And I'm coming to you with that confidence. I'm excited. Normally when I'm, it's my time to get up here, I'm nervous. And the staff is asking, how you feeling? And I'm like, I'm going to be okay. It's all right. I've got this. God's got this. But this morning there's an excitement in me to talk about negativity. Like what? I, but I feel like, <laughs> I feel like this is the time to really, to dive in and to address our stinking thinking. And for God to shine a light in some darkness in our lives. And so I want to dive into our scripture. It comes from Philippians. This is a life verse for me. I have started to commit, I've committed this to memory over the years and tried to, my best to live this practice because I've noticed in my own life where my own stinking thinking has gotten in the way. We're going to talk about that. But I want to go to this verse in Philippians 4 8. This is a now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Say that out loud. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Fix your thoughts. That title, this series, it really has a double meaning. It does mean to fix our thoughts as in we have some broken thinking going on that needs some mending. It's not helpful to us. And so there's some thoughts that need to be fixed in our lives. But it also, it means for us to focus our thoughts, to fix our thoughts, to, to, to zoom in on a certain kind of thought that will be helpful and bring healing. And Paul says very, these very things. He says, fix your thoughts or focus your thoughts on things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely. Look at the message translation. If you need maybe a more modern version of it, look at the message translation. It says, summing it all up, friends, I'd say you do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. Get this part. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise and not things to curse. If Paul tells the church in Philippi to fix their thoughts on those things, it tells me that we do have power and control over our thought lives. We do. Pastor Michael has a great analogy. He always says we can't control what flies over, but we can control what we allow to make a nest. 
You can't help the thought that crosses over, but you can help what you allow to stay in there and to fixate on and to obsess over and to meditate on. Do you hear me? We do have a responsibility when it comes to what we allow to stay in our minds. So a thought may cross over, and we are told to cast it out, to take it captive. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. There's no secret that there is a mental health crisis in our nation. There's no secret. Even though we don't talk about it enough in the church, we can't ignore the fact that it, there is a mental health crisis we, we know that in the 80s, they started tracking the research, tracking the data, tracking the trends, and that starting in the 80s, that about 8% of the U.S. population dealt with some type of mental health issue. 8%. So we're talking about depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. The list goes on and on. We, we, could, we could continue on. 8%. That's about 20 million people in our population. So... Over the last few years, we've seen that number rise to about 9%. Do you know that in the last six months, that number has grown exponentially, and now they're saying 25 to 30% of our population. 25 to 30% of our population during this COVID, COVID crisis, during this pandemic, has admitted to some type of a mental health struggle through all of this. Primarily, it's depression and anxiety, but that's not the end of the list. 25% of our population in the United States. That's a staggering number. And we as the church have been quiet about it for far too long. Yes. I think it's because we didn't know how to speak to it. Because at times we've seen that, that maybe science and scripture were on polar opposites in how we deal with things. That science handles it one way and scripture handles it another. But I'm here to tell you that's not the case Science is catching up to Scripture, and I'm going to share some research with you because you've been told for so long that maybe the church is behind the times and how they deal with the mental health crisis. But I want to tell you that's not the case. Science is showing more and more that what God has laid out in His Word are the exact prescriptions that we need for how to deal with the mental health crisis. 25 to 30%. Now, I know when I say those numbers... You can say, oh, that's a lot. That's high. Man, that's a lot of people. But I want to put it in perspective for you. That's one out of every four people. So I want you to look around this room this morning because I think it changes when we personalize it. One out of every four people in this room is dealing or will deal with a mental health issue. That's one of your pastors. That's somebody in your life group. That may be somebody sitting next to you that's struggling with depression or anxiety or has, a bi a bi has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Do you hear me? That's your brothers and sisters in this room. That's your family, your children, your mom, your dad, your aunt, aunts and uncles. That's your coworker. We're not removed from this. And though it's not been touched on, now more than ever, we have got to speak to this. We've got to address this. And so that's my hope and prayer through this series is that I can, I can speak to just some small aspects. Because let me just tell you, I'm not going to scratch the surface of this. I'm not going to scratch the surface of this. And I want to make sure I, I have, make this dis disclaimer. I'm not a mental health expert. I am not a mental health expert. So if anything through this series rings true to you, if anything touches a nerve with you, please, please seek help. I would be glad to point you in the direction of a mental health counselor, a Christian, Bible-believing, Bible-based mental health counselor, because it does matter. It does matter that we get counseled from the Word of God if we are Christians who believe that the Word of God is the one true, one true constant in our lives. It does matter. So please, if, if, anything, if anything rings true, if you are struggling, please, please don't, feel, don't be afraid to reach out. And you're not alone. 25 to 30 percent of our population, hear me, you are not alone in this. Reach out to someone. I gave you a handout when you got in here. And I put in big bold letters and bright highlight at the very top, do not throw this away or ignore this. Because I know, 
I know folks. This questionnaire is part of today's message, and it will be talked about. Now, I'm not going to ask you to share your answers because this is not for me to look at. This is really to get you to think about your thinking, to get you to think about where your mind goes. Because like I said, sometimes things become such habit that we just claim that as it is. Though well, that's just how I am. That's just what happens. I have no control or responsibility over it, and that's not the case. So before I talk about this, I, I want to make sure and point out a couple of things to you. Something that in my research over the last so many months and just in my own personal experience, um, something that I've found to be true, all of the leading doctors, psychologists, neuroscientists, all of the leading experts in this field would agree that in order for there to be lasting healing, lasting effects, that there are key areas that need to be addressed or looked at or studied when you're talking about someone's mental health. That if someone has a diagnosis of, let's say, bipolar disorder or depression or anxiety, there are key areas that have to all be addressed in order for the most healing to take place. So I want you to post these on the screen, and I'm just going to briefly go through these four key, I'm sorry, three key areas. The first one is biological, how your physical body functions. If you are having a mental health issue or a mental health crisis, Doctors agree that there may be some biological things going on with us that, have, that affect our mood or our emotions. And let me give you an example. This will ring true once I say this, okay? So for men, they've seen research, they've seen links to high levels of testosterone in men. The hormone testosterone can lead to increased aggressiveness, anger, and rage. So that is a biological issue that will affect our mood and our behavior. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So doctors agree that this is one of the areas, one of the three areas that needs to be addressed if there are mental health issues in place. Women, I, I'm just going to say this, and I ask the pastor's permission on this. There are some seasons and times in our lives when our hormones fluctuate. You're laughing because you know where I'm going with this. In, they fluctuate quite a bit, menopause and menstruation. Let's just call it what it is. These are seasons where biological factors affect our mental, our mood, right? Our mental health. In fact, and for some people, it is so severe in his book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, by Dr. Daniel Amen. I would recommend this. He is a Christian doctor who does an amazing job of marrying science and scripture. Anyways, in his book, he does quite a bit of brain scans to see what's going on with the brain. And he had a, a case study where a woman presented with severe, severe mood swings to the point that she was like a different person. And they did a brain scan on this lady four days prior to her menstruation, and they did another brain scan four days into it, and it looked like two totally different people. Her brain changed that much because of the hormones in her body and how it affected her. Do you hear me? So there are some biological factors that can change or affect our thinking and our mood, our behavior. They also agree that there are some psychological factors, our developmental issues and how we think. So if you've been the victim of any kind of trauma, it will change your brain. Abuse. Neglect, long-term stress, all of these factors have an influence on our brain and its ability to function in a healthy way. And then we've got spiritual, our sense of meaning and purpose. See, science is finally catching up to Scripture. They recognize that they can address the biological and they can address the psychological, but if they don't touch on the spiritual, if you're not connected to your sense of meaning and purpose... If you're not healthy spiritually, the other two will not be as effective. And the same thing goes with the biology. If they can give you pills to address the biology, but they don't address the psychology or the spiritual, you're only going to get a portion of the healing that you need. Scripture tells us that we are three parts. We are mind, body, and spirit or soul, right? Well, science is recognizing that in order to treat 
somebody, the most effective way, we've got to address these three issues. You hear me? They're not in competition with each other. God's Word has laid it out all along. Science is just catching up with it. And I love that. So today, I, I want to make sure you understand, if you are struggling with depression, if you are struggling with severe anxiety, make sure that you work with a doctor who is looking at all of these components. And the things that I share with you today, I've told you I am not a mental health expert. I'm going to speak to one of these areas, and I'm just going to scratch the surface. But make sure that you pursue help and get all the help that you need. Do you hear me? Yes. So I want to talk about... I want to talk about the psychological, and I'm going to address the spiritual also. I gave you the questionnaire when you came in, and, and even if you didn't do it, let me just ask. Let me just see. Who can honestly say they picked it up and then put it back down and didn't give it another thought? Thank you, Brad. I appreciate you being honest. <laughs> How many of you looked over it briefly and then put it back down and didn't give it another thought? Some, okay, I appreciate that. How many of you took the time to actually answer the questions? Okay, okay. Yeah, give it to you. If I had the gold star, I'd give it to you. I'm excited about that. There's a reason for this. And I think if you were to look back over your choices, you would start to see a pattern in the choices that you made. I think by now you probably recognized that you, you have leanings one way or the other. These questions are designed to identify the kind of thinking or the kind of person that you are, what we would describe as a positive thinker or a negative thinker. There's a term we, we you say you're an optimist or you're a pessimist. You see the glass half full or you see the glass half empty. You understand that? You see where I'm going with that? And so if you answered honestly, I think that you probably would even be able to see at this point exactly what you are. And maybe you already know. Maybe you already know what your leanings are. And you may wonder, what's the big deal? I don't have any control over my thoughts. It's just who I am. It's not my fault. I'm not being negative. I'm just being real. When I was typing this out, when I was preparing, I imagined some folks in my mind to say that very thing. I'm not being negative. I'm just being realistic. That's just life. That's just life. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody feel that way sometimes? I'm not negative. I'm just realistic. And there's a reason you think that, because you've had experiences in your past that would cause you to think that way. And let me say this. When we're going to start talking about negativity in just a minute, I want you to understand, I don't in any way want to, want to minimize the pain or the things that you may have gone through that have caused you to think in this way. That's not my goal. My goal here today is just to get us all thinking about our thinking and to look at God's Word because there are dangers. There are dangers to not addressing our thought life, to letting things just run free however they will and not speaking truth to the lies that we believe. There's dangers to that. It will affect our relationships. It will affect our body. More than that, it's going to affect us spiritually, and we're going to look at God's Word. Are you tracking with me this morning? All right, let's look at some types of negativity. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. I think you can read for yourself. The first one, cynicism, a general distrust of people and their motives. Number two, hostility, unfriendliness toward others and unwilling to develop relationships. Number three, filtering. Only noticing the bad in what should be a happy experience or memory. Lord have mercy. I was, my own toes were getting stepped on when I was reading all this, y'all. Polarized thinking. The belief that if something or someone is not perfect, then they must be horrible. So someone makes a bad choice and we classify them as a bad person. That's polarized thinking. Jumping to conclusions, assuming something bad will happen because of circumstances in the present. I'll give you an example of a very conversation I've had. I had someone ask me one time, do you think so-and-so is mad at me? Well, why, I don't know. Why would you say that? Well, she didn't say hi to me when she walked into church this morning. Let's jump into conclusions. You're assuming 
something bad because of the circumstance when there could be a myriad of reasons that someone didn't say hi. They could be rushing to get back to the children's ministry because they're running late. Come on, that's me every, every time. They could have something on their mind, something that they had an argument with their husband on the way to church and they're focused on that and thinking through that. You understand what I'm saying? But negative thinking would have us jump to conclusions and assume the worst. Catastrophizing, the belief that disaster is inevitable. Let me tell you this. Our social media outlets, our news outlets, they make their millions and billions on that one principle right there. Every one of them. I could tell you, I could give you a podcast to listen to from a major news journalist who did a study because he recognized that the field, the industry that he was in was capitalizing off of the negative stories that they were pushing to the masses, emphasizing the worst of every situation, trying to incite division. Every one of our news media outlets and social media outlets, they, they capitalize off of that. Blaming, blaming others for personal maladies and feeling that you are a victim to life's uncontrollable events. Yes, things happen to us that are beyond our control, but what we do have control over is how we deal with them. Emotional reasoning, oh, if this does not summarize our world, using your emotions to define what is real and what it's not. Because I feel this way, it must be true. Because this crossed my mind, it must be real. This is the world that we live in. Fallacy of change. To think that if people or circumstances change, you can then be happy. These are types of negative thinking. I'm going to move quickly. Woo! Got a lot to cover. Let's go back to that scripture where Paul tells the church in Philippi, fix your... Well, thank you. <laughs> Paul tells the church in Philippi, fix your thoughts. Think on these things. Think on these things. This is one of the very first churches that Paul established, and they were very supportive of his missionary endeavors. They supported him financially. They sent him help when they needed it. So Paul is writing to them at a time where he is being held captive. He's either in a Roman prison or he's under house arrest. And so what he's telling them is don't look at the present circumstances. Don't let that dictate where your mind goes. You think about these things, things that you know to be true and honorable and right and pure and lovely, things that are worthy of praise. So if anybody had, I think, some legitimacy or some authenticity in his preaching and his message, it would have been Paul in that moment because his circumstances looked so very different than what he was telling them to fixate on. And that happens to us, but that cannot be an excuse. Our current circumstances cannot be an excuse to where we allow our minds to go. Number one, my first point, we have to take control of our thought lives. We have to. Paul tells the church in in Philippi to direct their thinking. And maybe I'm just a simpleton, but I think that if Paul said, think about these things, that means that we can choose to think about those things. That means that we do have some control over our thought lives. There's a verse that I love in Corinthians. It says, we are to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And read this, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We're not victims to our thought lives. Listen to this story. You know it. It's such a a common, it goes back to the very beginning. This has been a problem from the get-go. Adam was in, we'll start in Genesis chapter 4. Adam was intimate with his wife, Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. Then she also gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portion. So there's a direct difference in the description that we see here. It says that Cain presented an offering. But when we look at Abel, it, it, gives a, it says it's some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portion. We see a better description because Abel made a better offering. Cain gave what, what he had. Abel gave the best of what he had. And it says the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Listen to this. But he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious 
and he looked despondent. Listen to how the Lord speaks to Cain. Go ahead. The Lord said to him, why are you furious and why do you look despondent? Hear this, people. If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. The Lord is telling Cain, there are consequences to your choices. You made a decision to offer up what you had. Your brother offered up the best. He has found favor, and now you're angry because he found my favor. And your anger is going to cause you to sin if you don't get a handle on it. You must rule over it, he says. The Lord asked him, why are you furious? Why are you despondent? God knew. He knew why he was upset. I think he was trying to get Cain to think about his emotions and why he was feeling that way. Maybe take some ownership. You know, I'm upset because I didn't handle this right. I didn't do all that I could do. But God tells him, your desire is one thing, and if you don't get a handle on this, it's going to cause you to sin. You've got to get the control over this. So despondent, the word despondent, it's a mood. It's an extreme feeling of discouragement, dejection, or depression. God's saying to Cain, you've got to get a hold of these negative feelings. And here's why. Point number two. You can put that negative thinking will affect us relationally. Yes. It will have an impact on our relationships. You know the story. Most of us know this story. It spills over into our relationship. It spilled over into Cain's relationship with his brother. Let me go back and remind you of his thinking. You can put that back up there. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious and why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do what is, but if sin is crouching, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It's desirous for you, but you must rule over it. Listen to this in verse 8. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. Now, I know that seems like an extreme when we're talking about mental health or our thought lives. So let me break that down for you. It may not mean the physical death of a relationship. It may not drive you to murder. But there are other ways that relationships can suffer because of our thoughts. If we don't get a handle, if we don't get control of our thought lives, There are other ways that a relationship can suffer. Do you hear me? Constant cynicism and distrust of people, it will hinder your ability to have healthy, intimate relationships. You're going to put a wall up, you're going to put a guard up, and it's going to hinder your ability to have a healthy relationship. Do you hear me? Only recognizing the bad in someone not taking time to find the good, only focusing on their mistakes, but not pointing out the growth or the good that you see, it will destroy your relationships. And if you don't know whether or not your negativity has affected your relationships, ask. And if someone is comfortable enough to be honest with you, then listen and don't get defensive. Now, if they're not comfortable enough to be honest with you, I think that speaks volumes. Do you hear me? If they can't tell you how your negativity has affected your relationship, that should speak volumes to you. Our negative thoughts will affect us relationally. We have to get control over our thought lives, and we can. Because Paul told the church in Philippi to do it. God told Cain to do it. It can happen, and we have to look at how our negativity affects our relationships because it will have an impact. I'm going to keep going. Number three, I'm going to stay here a minute. Negative thinking will affect us physically. We don't always realize the mind and body connection, but research is showing us more and more that our thoughts will take a toll on our bodies. Some folks, they believe that a disease or an illness is the reason that they're constantly tired or they have aches and pains. But research tells us that negative thinking could be the reason could be the reason. Pessimists affect more than just our emotional health, pessimism. In fact, doctors have found that high levels of stress produce a chemical in your body called cortisol. So when you're stressed for a long period of time, when you have negative thoughts for a long period of time, your body goes into what is called a fight or flight mode. 
And for a long time, if your body is in fight or flight mode for an extended period of time, your cortisol is released in your body. And I want to tell you what they've linked that to. Degenerative brain diseases such as dementia, they have found that people who have stress and anxiety at higher levels than others also have a higher rate of dementia and degenerative brain diseases. Do you hear me? It affects you physically. They found a link to cardiovascular problems, digestive issues, longer recovery times when you're sick, that people who tend to live and think in the negative, that they also recover at a much slower rate. Their bodies don't heal as fast. There's a list I want you to look at. And you can look this up. I'm not making this up. There's so much research out there. How the body responds to negative thinking, headache, chest pain, fatigue, upset stomach. Think about a person that you know that's constantly worried or anxious. I have somebody, I'm not, mm -hmm. Hmm. always upset stomach, always has an upset stomach, sick to their stomach all the time, doesn't sleep, up at all hours of the night, insomnia often. Anxiety, depression, social withdrawal, drastic changes in metabolism. So that's quick weight gain or quick weight loss because of negative thinking. Because of negative thinking. A study found that the habit of prolonged negative thinking diminishes your, abilities, your brain's ability to think, to reason, and to form memories. Basically, it drains your brain's resources. You don't recover as quick. Your quality of life goes down. They're finding links, greater and greater links, like I said, to dementia. I don't know about you, but if, if I can get a handle on this and prevent these things, I want to do that. If I've been attributing this to other things, but it's been my thought life all along, I want to get a handle on that. I was having a conversation with somebody this week that was just relaying memories from a, a, a family struggle that they had had a couple years back. And she said she remembered that she was broken out in hives for a period of time during this family struggle. And when she looks back now, she recognizes it was because of the stress and the turmoil and the negativity within the family. I know in my own life, you know, I had a, I had a baby back in March. So it was right on the eve of the pandemic, the week that my son was due, they, they were shutting everything down. The hospital called me. I, I was scheduled to have a C-section because I had another child a year ago. And so I, I was scheduled to have a, a cesarean section. And the hospital called me over the course of a couple of days trying to figure out, are, you gonna let my, are they going to let my husband attend with me or is he going to have to stay home and I'm going to have to do it by myself? You don't want to talk about stress. Thankfully, they let him in the room. He was able to, to recover, you know, help me recover but even after my son was born, we were in isolation for the first six weeks. I was, I was on my own for the first six weeks. My husband was at work, and it was just me with a newborn and a toddler. You want to talk about anxiety. You want to talk about stress, some depression. Now, there were some biological factors. Let's be honest, women. Your body goes through so many changes when you have children and hormones. That's an that's a issue. In it. That's, that's a whole series in itself. But then there were, some, there were some environmental factors that had to play. I struggled, struggled. I still, to this day, I have to really battle some anxiety. And I'm going to talk about that more in the next couple of weeks. But it has an effect. I didn't sleep. I wasn't sleeping because I had a baby. And then I wasn't sleeping because I was stressed because I had a baby. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so it play, it wreaks havoc. And we're not even talking about the effects of sleeplessness or lack of sleep on the body. That's a whole other issue. Negativity will affect us physically, but this is where I want to hit, and I'm going to close on this one. I want to talk about how negativity affects us spiritually. Are you getting anything out of this this morning? I appreciate it. I'm going to talk about how it affects us spiritually. We're going to go back to the Old Testament again. I want to give you just a little precursor here. So the children of, of Israel have been delivered out of Egypt, out of, the, out of the land of Pharaoh, and they're in the wilderness, and God has promised them a land of their own. And God tells Moses, I want you to send spies, send 12 spies over into the promised land to camp out and to spy, to see what's before you, one from each tribe. And so Moses sends 12 spies, one from each tribe, over into the promised land. 
And while they're there, Moses says, I want you to look and see. Check out the people. Who are we up against? Are these people organized? Is this a city or are they encampments around? Are they, are they you know, maybe still kind of wild? What does the fruit look like? What is the, the soil like? What do, we, what do we have here? What is before us? And so the 12 spies go over. And this is the report that they bring back. It says, and they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They present him with a bunch of grapes. And they say, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. So historically, these were people who were known to be big people. They would be classified as giants, really. Historically, so the, the, the sentence of a knacker there. Let's keep going. But Caleb, he was one of the spies. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Okay. We've got ten people presenting one side of the story, and we've got two, Joshua and Caleb, who were seeing something totally different. He says, these men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Keep going. So they brought to the people of Israel, what does that say? A bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw, these are the giants that he was speaking of. These, historically, they were described as giants. Like Goliath, when David battled Goliath, it is said that Goliath was of great statues, great height. That's, that's where it comes from. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. The ten, remember there were 12 spies. You have ten who look at the circumstances and say, there's no way. There's no way we can do this. But then you have two, Joshua and Caleb, who say, look, this is the land God has promised us. Let's go take the land that God has promised us. He will bring us through. Let's keep going. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. Remember what I told you, that those ten delivered a bad report. Our negative thinking will affect our relationships. Their bad report affected the rest of God's people. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we would have died in this wilderness. Do you understand what has just happened? They have just been delivered out of the hand of Pharaoh. Amazing things. I mean, they've seen amazing things. And now they're hearing, listening to the report of these ten spies saying, oh, woe is us. We can't do this. And now they're angry at God and angry at the leadership. What have you, we might as well have stayed there to rot. He says, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? Let's keep going. And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and let's go back to Egypt. We're going to walk out of the promises that God has for us and return because of fear, because of one bad report. Do you hear me? I want to keep, I know it, right? Let's keep going. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. See, this didn't, this didn't sit well with God. He said this, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing... I will do to you. You say that I'm leaving you to the inhabitants of this land, that you're going to fall prey. Okay, you're going to get what you speak. That's what he says. Your dead body shall fall in this wilderness. Whew. And all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell. They're saying all of you who believe the report, the negativity, the report of those ten spies, you will never walk into the promised land that I have prepared for you. Never. Except Caleb, the son of... Yes, and Joshua, the son of Nun. What's that name again? Jephuna? <laughs> but your little ones... This is where God is so merciful. But your little ones who said you would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. God is so merciful. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. Your 
dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. Let's keep going. We're almost through. And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. So I, let me stop there for just a second because God is so gracious. And he said, your children will enter the promised land, but they're going to suffer for the next 40 years because of your faithfulness. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Our faithfulness can have an impact on the next generation because that's what negativity is. It's faithlessness. Our faithlessness can have an impact on the next generation. Yes, they would see the promised land, but what would they have to suffer before they did? What would they have to go through before they did? We have got to get a handle on our thought lives. We have got to get control of our thought lives. It will affect our relationships, it will affect our bodies, and it will affect us spiritually. And more than that, it will affect the next generation if we don't get control of this. Do you hear me? Your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. And we know. You study the rest of Scripture and we know that's exactly what happened. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. Because they believed the negativity, the report of those 10 spies who looked at what was before them. They didn't take into account all that God had already done for them, they looked at the circumstances, their present circumstances, and they fixated and focused on those things instead of all that God could do. Right. Uh-oh is right. Lord, Lord, I hope that you feel a sense of urgency here. My goal this morning is not to, <laughs> I don't want you to leave feeling like doom and gloom because we have a hope. Do you hear me? I told you, we are not victims to our thought lives. We are not victims to our thought lives. Scripture, in fact, tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Yes. That the old has passed away and the new will come. We are made overcomers. Our minds can be renewed. And so what I want to do this week, my goal was really just to get you thinking about your thinking to get you thinking about where your thoughts go. And so I have an assignment for you this week. I know, we leave church with homework. We've got, we've got a test, and then we leave with homework. That's the teacher coming out of me. What I want you to do this week is I just want you to think about your thoughts. Where does your mind go? When you encounter a new situation, where does your mind go? In your relationships, when something happens, where does your mind go? When something doesn't work out in your life and you face a struggle, where does your mind go? Do you automatically assume that God is mad at you? That he's teaching you a lesson? Where does your mind go? And then over the next two weeks, we're going to talk about how to get control of these things. God is so faithful and He is so good. And He doesn't just leave us in the state that we're in. I think Jesus Christ is evident of that. Adam made a choice that affected us all. But God sent Jesus to make it right. So take hope. Take comfort in the fact if you do struggle with negativity, if negative thoughts are your natural leaning, if you're maybe considered a, a pessimist, you think the glass half empty, that's okay. That's okay. Our minds can be renewed. There's hope for us all. Amen? Amen. It's a little different today. <laughs> I do want to close with a prayer. Um, and so I want everybody to bow your heads, if you will. Here's what I'd like to do. If this struck a chord in you, if maybe as I spoke something resonated or you saw yourself in these descriptions when we posted the types of critical think or the types of negative thinking, if any of that rang true, if you feel like I was talking to you this morning, if I've been reading your journal, 
this morning. Can you just slip a hand up for me? Nobody look at, oh, I see two hands on some folks. I love it. Thank you. Because the thing is, is we can't get better if we don't admit there's a problem. Right? Thank you for your honesty. And I think there's probably even more in this place that maybe you were too afraid to raise your hand. So I'm going to pray for everybody here and for these next few weeks. Father, I thank you that you are the Father of light and that light drives out darkness. Lord, all of us, all of us at times struggle with darkness in our thinking. All of us at times have to fight the battle of cynicism and making assumptions. All of us have to fight those battles. Father, I just ask that over this next week that you would make us mindful of, of when those thoughts occur. Help us to think about our thinking, Lord. Show us, reveal to us those areas, Lord, where our thoughts exalt themselves against the knowledge of you. Where our thoughts lie to us and say, I'll never overcome this. It'll never get better. I'm always going to struggle with this. God, you're mad at me. Where our thoughts lie to us, Lord, show us. Because I believe, I trust with all of my heart that over the next couple of weeks, Lord, that you're going to shine some light. You're going to bring some truth to those lies. Lord, I pray that we don't walk out of here feeling dejected and down, but Lord, that we have a hope and a confidence that he who has began a good work in us will continue it. Yes. Will continue it. You don't just leave us in our mess. You don't leave us in where we are, God, but you're calling us to a higher place, a place of greater faithfulness in you. Yes. We ask all these things, Jesus, and we'll give you all glory. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord praise this morning. My goodness. Were you blessed by that today? Say amen. amen. Listen, let me just say to you, in case there might be one or two of you that think, well, Pastor Haley's doing this series, I'm going to lay out. You need to deal with your stinking thinking because you're going to miss it. We've been preparing, she's been preparing particularly for this all year long, looking for the right time. And I truly believe that this is uh, the sovereign timing of the Lord in what literally what our whole nation's facing what people around the world are facing because of the stress levels that we're all dealing with. And I just want to say to you to come with a hungry heart, come ready to receive, come ready to hear. Scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I, I was struck by that passage that she read that those 10 spies brought a bad report. And I was sitting there thinking of Isaiah 53. It says, whose report will you believe? Everybody say, we shall believe the report of the Lord. His report says, I am healed. Come on, somebody say, his report says, I am healed. His report says, I am blessed. His report says, I am well. You know what? You need to look to his report. That is the word of the Lord and see what it says and then renew your thinking based on what the word of God says and not how you feel your feelings can fool you, not your circumstances, because they change. Man, give Pastor Haley another hand this morning, if you would. So good. So good, so good. I, um, back earlier, way earlier in the, in the year when everything was canceled, uh, we met as a team, and normally we do shared series throughout the year, which is uh, intentional because it helps develop uh, this generation um, I'm not going to be around forever, um, and I'm helping to grow and to be able to in, uh, coach and encourage and strengthen a next generation of solid leaders, and I'm so proud of our team. At the same time, when we met, they said, you know what, Pastor, we're, we're, everything's going to be online, and the people really want to hear from the leader, and I said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go forward with it, and basically, I'd, I hadn't had a break until Father's Day, and I went to Fort Worth to see my, my, my grandson, and then I went back again to Fort Worth in September. Jeremy took Father's Day, pa uh, Pastor Haley, Pastor Jeremy took Father's Day, Pastor Haley took September so I could go down there for Henry Wade's birthday. And so um, he had had 
February to do his series, and I challenged him at the end of last year. I said, this year, I don't want to just do shared series. I want both of you to develop your own series. I I want you to grab a thought. I want you to take it, develop it. It's yours alone. And he did a phenomenal job in February, and I've been waiting to see this come in November. And so please be here, be here in support, uh, because we're a family, and it's not just all about hearing from me, okay? Somebody say amen, okay? I appreciate your love for me and your support for me, but these are, we're an extension of the Lord, and we are part of each other. And uh, there's great, great strength in what's happening, what's coming. I personally was ministered to, I learned things this morning from Pastor Haley. So, yes, give her a hand. All right. I'm up here not just to say the, the obvious in encouragement to her, but I just want to say this. We're, our crowds are growing. Um, we, we really, really need folk to come forward and help us out with some serve teams so that we can begin to take steps to going to two services because it's just about maxed out in here in terms of social distancing. We need help, and what we will more than likely do, I'm not talking out of school here because we've had these conversations, more than likely because we don't really have all the help yet for our children's ministry to function in both, we will probably do only one service where we offer children's ministry. So we would have a 9 o'clock without it and then a 1045 with children's ministry. That's what's on the table. Now, don't, don't go out here and say that's the law because that's not written in stone. Things could change. But we do need help in all of our other areas, in ushers, in greeters. Uh, Probably the first of the year, we will not get our coffee service back up and running until then. And we'll probably post somebody right there to do all the handling and pushing and filling the cups. One person that's gloved. And we're obviously trying to do everything we can to to deal with uh, protection, take all the measures. Thank you to Michael Rushing and his quality cleaning service who came in here and brought uh, a state-of-the-art technology, technological uh, fogger with the stuff that will kill any COVID germs immediately. They fogged every one of these rooms. The whole building's been cleaned from that. And so we're doing everything we know how to do to be able to protect you. Um, service is a little shorter than they used to be. And so we want to be able to bless you while you're here. Crowds have grown. Now, this is, this is the, the, the downside. The offerings have gone down. I don't know why. Mine hasn't. I'm still giving what I, what I, what I give. Um, but if you're having a challenging time, then please do not think anything. Uh, we'll, we'll be more than happy to pray with you. And if you're up against it, we want to do everything we can to help you in every way that we possibly can. But if, if you're here and you're not giving consistently, consistently, I would like to ask you to take a step of faith and begin to do that. This morning, we really need uh, a blessing. We don't need a cane offering where you just throw in a little bit. We need an April offering, okay? I'm going I'm to borrow from what she said, and I didn't even know she was teaching on that. We need, we need everybody to step forward and say, okay, God, I want to give you the first fruits. I want to I bring off the top. I want to bless. Offerings for the last six weeks have consistently been down at least $4,000 a week. One week, they were down 8000 Now, you can't keep operating with that kind of a situation with any kind of a budget, because we are frugal and there is absolutely a moratorium on any spending period that's unnecessary. We have a little bit of margin, but we're quickly every week eating that up. And so I just would like to challenge you, please. And if you don't have, if you do not have the wherewithal to be able to give sacrificially this morning, everybody in the room can give some time to prayer because God can move. Come on, somebody. God can move dramatically and bring great Great, 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 great blessing. I've seen him do it over and over and over. Could give you multitudes of testimonies. Matter of fact, let me just tell you how I'm thinking. I'm definitely not the glass is half full. You know how I'm praying? I'm saying, God, I thank you for $5 million to pay off this building. It's, we owe three and a half on it. It's worth five. Well, why are you asking for five? Because we got a phase two we want to finish. We want to, we want to pour that whole parking lot out. Not the parking lot, but the circle drive between us and the pond and a whole triangular section over there with cafe lights that seats about a hundred in an outdoor fireplace so the the guys can have man cave night and the women can have party on the patio and can do cool things outside and so they say I'm still thinking ahead and I'm still thinking like hey we can possess this land okay now I I, uh, I don't want to quench anybody if you want to give five million in the offering this morning that'll be great and we'll celebrate Realistically, I'm not expecting that, but I just, we just need some budget, okay? So um, there's no pressure. And you know, you know how I hate having to get up here and do this. 
But please, I ask you, wherever you are, if you're not giving consistently, I ask you to pray and ask the Lord what he would have you to begin to do consistently to support this vision and this mission. We want to be a blessing to you and to the, and to the community. Those of you that are giving faithfully, thank you. We, we, we could not make it without you. And so this morning, very quickly, just pray with me. Father, lead us, guide us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for that amazing word today. Help each of us in ways that we might be wrestling with some stinking thinking in our finances. Help us, Lord, to be seed conscious and not just need conscious. Help us to bring an able offering, the very best that we can. I ask you to bless this people, multiply the favor of God in each of their lives. Bless them, Lord, with raises and promotions and, and blessings from unexpected areas. We look to you. We know that you hadn't brought us in here to leave us and let us hang. God, we thank you for provision, for the vision, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, put your hands together and give the Lord praise. What an amazing word that was this morning. That was awesome. Thank you so much. If you made a fresh start today, we want to know about it. So if you'll please let us know at info at victorywire.com. Um, we just want to know about this fresh start and go through this next journey with you. If you have any prayer requests, um, our frontline prayer team is still going strong. Um, you can text those prayers or your prayer praises to 870-559-1588. Um, as you know, Victory Kids, Kids is back open. They're having a great time back there. Um, we are we are full this morning, so praise God for that. We're glad to have all the babies and everybody's happy. It's great for the most part. We had a few a few little uh, um, little issues, but we're good. Um, so each week we need you to register your kiddos so that we can be prepared for you guys and have um, space for your kids. Make sure that we have snacks prepared and, and that sort of thing. So if you please um, just make sure that you go to Victory Wired. Com. Click on ministries, go to Victory Kids, and just make sure you can register there. Also, you can register on the app. You can do that on the app. And I think that we were posting a link maybe on Facebook as well. So just make sure you get those kiddos registered. Um, and as Pastor said, we need some help back there. We would love to open back up um, to two services. But like he said, we are limited with our volunteers. So if you have a heart to serve, please um, contact us, reach out to us. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer anything, let you know what we're doing back there, um, because we just love these children. It's not a babysitter. Um, it's a ministry that we have back here, and so um, it's important that we feed into these children, and so we just ask you to be in prayer, and if that's something that the Lord's put on your heart, please come come see us. We, we'd like to place you somewhere. Um, and as, as I'm talking about needing some help here, um, do I have any strong men in here? Oh, uh, what? Pastor Jeremy is ready. I heard that. I heard that. Okay, so we have a storage building. I think uh, Michael Rushing has been gracious to let us store a bunch of stuff from our old building um, as we move to get transitioned, and we need to get that stuff out of there. So we need some able bodies on Saturday, November 14th at 10 a.m., maybe just a few hours so that we can get some things moved. Um, if you're able to help, if you could please text 901 Four eight four six three three one, and um, put your name in that text so that we can get some updates for you um, and let you know what's going on. So blessed to have you. If you would please prepare your heart for our last act of worship, collecting tithe and offering. Have a blessed day. Bye bye. <laughs> 